Good evening and welcome back to the Galway Film FLA. Uh, my name is Will Fitzgerald, programmer here at the FLA, and it's my pleasure to include the Winter Lake uh, in this year's lineup. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Some intense viewing for you uh, of a Friday evening. Um, and judging by the reaction coming in on social media, um, I think you guys felt the same. Uh, it's my pleasure now to be joined by um, some of the cast and crew from the film. Uh, we've got director Phil Sheeran, uh, we have screenwriter David Turpin, and we have cast Anson Boone and Mark McKenna. How are you doing, guys? Good, how are you? Thanks so much for joining us. Um, appreciate you being here uh, to talk to us and tell us a little bit about the film. Um, might just get stuck in while I wait for uh, people online to throw their questions at us. Uh, for those of you who are watching at home, uh, just hashtag us Galway Film or with hashtag Filmfla, and uh, I'll pass on your questions to the guys. Um, but I might just start with one of my own, uh, David. Um, since it all begins with the script, um, you know, I'm watching this movie and I'm thinking, this is written by the same guy who wrote uh, The Lodgers. And here we have a another sort of a rural uh, based mystery with a, a young man who you know, was quite interested in the macabre. And I'm wondering, there's got to be some little thread of, you know, autobiographical element or personal connection uh, to Tom in this story. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm a rural man who's interested in the macabre. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I, uh, I suppose so. I mean, truthfully, the, the the person who I've always identified with more in the film is is Holly, whatever that says about me. But uh, um, I, I, you know, I guess I drew on. I, I have acute memories of being that age, being being, you know, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, and and I, I think there probably were a few years in my adolescence when I didn't speak. A word. I mean, you know, other than kind of whatever was mandated at school or, or, or something, and I, and I guess like a lot of people, um, the trauma of adolescence has stayed with me <laughs> um, all my life. And you know, it's an interesting thing. I I, I had never really thought of it, but it, it it was pointed out to me that that most of the things I write tend to involve people in late adolescence and. Um, See, I had always thought I wrote for sophisticated adults, but 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 no, I seem to write a lot of, of people in their late teens, and I, I suppose it's just that that's a a time of becoming, and it's a time of um, you know where you're prof you you you're raw, you're a piece of raw meat, and and anything that is done to you at that time stays with you for life. Yeah, you know? and then you grow up, and you're like, oh well, they're the best years of your life. Well, perhaps they are. <laughs> Except when you're living them, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, you know, that uh, th that uh, adolescent trauma, I suppose, has made for some great cinema through the years. Um, and I suppose as well, I mean, this is really a coming of age film, but I suppose what separates, um, you know, uh, how films are categorized as coming of age tends to be the degree of darkness that they contain. And this is quite a dark film. Um, Phil, like at what stage did you become attached and what was it that drew you to the script? Uh, they'd already had a first draft, at least, I think with like the first draft with a bit of work on it. Uh, and it was sent to me, uh, this is three years ago, I think, maybe, maybe even a bit longer. Um, and the thing that just like, is like, as a director, I think every director needs to find a personal way to get inside like the script or the project. And it's always with characters for me, like character is story and character should be driving everything. Um, so when I read the script, like the first time, the character I identified most with, like really was the character, like kind of David was Elaine. Uh, there was just something in the loneliness in, in her character that just really spoke to me. And just that I felt like I understood the film through her first and then just through working with David further, just to explore more and then listening to David, just to, to get inside the world of the film more get to know the characters more and like yeah uh, the family dynamics and the psychology get, get, to, get to really get just get to grips with it I suppose. Yeah. yeah um you know talking about getting to grips with it um and the psychology of it um and so I wanted to ask you because you know everything about Tom is so internalized as well in a way um I, I kind of wondered what uh you know drew you to that role um, and was it difficult to, I suppose, emote a lot of what's happening internally? 
I guess what drew me to it was probably exactly that. I sort of found it fascinating that um, Tom has to, well, Tom doesn't feel that he can express himself or, or his emotions. And I feel like he has so much pent up feelings. Like I feel like he's just got so much love inside him that he can't give. He doesn't have anyone to give it to, or he doesn't know how to give it. And that really interested me. And, you know, Tom, I suppose, in order to keep an audience engaged, has to convey most things that most actors or characters would convey through speech, through his everything else, you know. And I, I just thought it would be fascinating to explore other ways in which, um, you know, Tom can convey his inner feelings and thoughts and stuff. That was really interesting. And I had a great time with Phil in like, the rehearsal process. We had like, so many conversations where we just had so many idea we like kids in a candy shop like chucking ideas out around t about tom and stuff and um ways that we could express what he was thinking and yeah it just fascinated me it was just a really interesting character to read cool. and it was an interesting character on screen as well and then i mean mark by comparison carl is obviously a much more um you know sort of visceral kind of character he's he even sort of i mean he's kind of the, the root cause of a lot of the um you know of the to sort of he's a catalyst i suppose for a lot of the action points that happen in the in the story yeah yeah definitely i think ko is definitely a character who is probably the kind of guy who goes home to his mom and he's like the nicest kid ever and he doesn't do anything bad at home <laughs> and then for some reason when he's out with his mates he tries to impress all of them uh i, li I like to think that ko was probably originally living somewhere else and then reluctantly had to move to this small town and that's why he's so angry is that he just hates living there and he hates all the people and he doesn't want to be there so he's just kind of like getting it out through any way he can and that's just torturing the other kids i suppose yeah um you, you've all kind of talked about you know um things underneath the surface and, and things being repressed and obviously the film is called the winter lake and you know, you think of those those turlocks that where you know things obviously rise up from beneath the surface. Um, was there always a specific? I mean, the location obviously lends so much to the film and to the atmosphere. Uh, did you guys have to go find your own uh, turlock? Was there always one in mind? How did that work, Phil? Yeah, we had to build it. I suppose like um, it was kind of like there was a lot of really specific geographical things in the script. Um, and to like, you know, you can shoot everything piecemeal and stitch it together, but I kind of wanted to keep connecting the geography, like the house to the lake and all this kind of thing. Um, so because most of the film happens in the house, like in uh, Tom and Lane's house, we needed to find that first, but then we needed to also make sure that wherever that was, we would have the ability to in some way flood a field and try and figure that out. And then the house we found, Vaughn, uh, randomly, well, like, like, by a miracle, had a natural spring. So we only had to dam the area up and then it would flood. Um, didn't quite go as big as we'd like it. We, we had to extend it, it with CG. So it, it wasn't quite as big as what we, we have in the finished film. But um, but it still had everything we needed. And it was like, it was perfect. It was gorgeous. So yeah, the landscape like says so much about the film and the way into their psychology and just general tone. Yeah, no, it, it really does. Um, uh, damming up um, a natural spring in, in winter in Sligo must have been um, a fun adventure. Uh, what was it like shooting uh, for you, Anson, in uh, you know the Irish West Coast in uh, in winter time? I just it was the way I just can describe the environment. It was beautiful, but it feels quite harsh and sort of unforgiving, and um, and so I think that it just helped with. Um, it helped me so much to be around that. I remember before we started filming, I took myself off on a little excursion around the area and I did like loads of public buses from Sligo around, went to Strand Hill and all different kinds of places and just sort of explored what it felt like to be, because it's nothing like where I live and just to be around these places for the first time, like it would be so alien to Tom as well. And um, I was just quite stunned by it all and amazed. And so, and sort of the, when, you know, the first sequence when you see Tom out exploring the, uh, the nearby countryside to his house with his little jackknife and stuff. It's um, really powerful and the, you know, the scenery and stuff is really um, like bright in your eyes and stuff. Um, and I thought it was so important and it really helped set the tone of the film, the setting that it was in. It felt like a metaphor for Tom's character, I felt. I felt like it was just like I was walking around my elements sort of thing. Yeah.
Absolutely. Um, we have some uh, comments rolling in on social media, just congratulating you guys on what a good job you've done. Uh, Barbara Nagonica uh, says, oh, real life Tom is so nice. <laughs> um, Viv O'Connor says, excellent, very atmospheric and gripping. Uh, not sure I'll sleep now. So uh, take that as a compliment, uh, I guess. Um, just coming back to you again, you know, um, it's quite an evocative script. Uh, it's a dark story. There's so many of these, I guess, all the characters are that kind of bit broken and they're looking for something more, something whole. Um, I mean, what was your, maybe David, I'll, I'll start with you, like your um, aspirations for an audience reaction to this story? Um, I never have any particular aspiration for what an audience will feel. I, I don't think it's your job as a as a filmmaker to try and instill a particular feeling in an audience. I think you you give them something about which they can feel something and then what they feel is their choice or, or, or their experience. And I would never try to mandate um, what an audience feels from what I write. I, I, I wouldn't know how to begin to do that. I mean, I, I suppose when I think about, you know, thematically, I suppose what I was trying to talk about with the film, um, I, I suppose in some ways what it's about is uh, our insignificance. And, you know, there's this landscape and it has its own life and it does its own things. And then there are all these people on the surface of the earth kind of scuttling around with their own little dramas and their crises and their hang ups and their loneliness and their desire and all this kind of stuff. And somehow the earth, which is indifferent to them um, can have this profound effect upon their lives that they have no way of, of preventing, they have no way of intervening in it. The earth somehow intervenes in, in our lives despite its indifference to us. And I suppose maybe it would be nice if people felt that when they, <laughs> when they walked out of a sense of their own insignificance <laughs> they wanted people to feel. <laughs> But in a nice way. I think everyone on Twitter is feeling a sense of their own insignificance, but not specifically about this. Um, I'll keep asking them. Um, Phil, about yourself, um, hopes for audience reaction to the film? I don't know. Well, hopefully they really empathize with the characters. So like at the end, I suppose, compassion towards people for actually how difficult life can be. Like uh, the thing me and David discussed it is about how like families and broken families and the idea that a um like the idea of a family being like you know home is where the heart is that's where like you know that's everything good in life is with family but as as this film points out but sometimes family is the actual place you have you have to escape like so there's an element of that going on so to have a little bit of um as i said compassion for these people but then there's also like on the actionable side of it of a theme it's just like how, like how in how in need to express love and be loved and all the very different versions of that can actually get inside you and kind of manipulate your own thinking and like you know like after a breakup you can like you, you're unrecognizable as a person because you lack self esteem and all this kind of thing so so all that was very important to me as a way of exploring the characters and giving them motivation in this particular world but um but yeah I know compassion I suppose for each other life is tough you know yeah absolutely and and on that mark i mean in talk talking about you know feeling sympathy towards the characters we talked about you know calls more irredeeming um irredeemable qualities but again these are all kind of broken people i mean do you ultimately hope that um or do you feel that he's ultimately a sympathetic character as well or uh, maybe not during the movie but definitely towards the end uh i think it's kind of it's kind of those things where me and me and Phil spoke about it spoke about it on set where it's like Cole comes across as this evil villain who's just out to kill Tom, and then kind of like and he looks like he's manipulating Holly, and all this kind of stuff. And then towards the end, you realize after the car accident that Holly's actually kind of the one manipulating Cole, and Cole's the one who wants to go back and check if they're okay and all that kind of stuff. And you start to realize that maybe you know he's actually, I mean he's he's not. A great person, but maybe he's not as bad as you thought he was. And then um, it's just one of those things where you then you start to realize that Holly is the one who she doesn't care if people die. She just wants to get out of there. And Carl is the one who kind of wanted to see if they were if they were fine. 
and wanted to go back and check on him. But uh, I definitely think maybe in that moment of the movie, people will sympathise with him and begin to realise that he's actually the one in the relationship who's being manipulated. Or maybe they're manipulating each other and it's just extremely toxic and we should we should sympathise with neither of them. Maybe they're just both terrible people. <laughs> sure. Um, you mentioned Holly and not, not obviously not all of our uh, cast members uh, could be here with us this evening, but Anson, maybe you could tell us uh, what it was like um, working uh, with Emma and with uh, Charlie. It was really good. Um, I found Emma was so committed to um, to playing Holly and I feel like she had a real challenge with that because it is such a, I, I didn't play it, but I imagine it is such a difficult role to play. But I always remember when I was with her, I just, sometimes when you work with an actor, I'm just so um, taken aback at how I don't feel like I'm talking to the person that I know I felt like I was talking to Holly. I just felt like she was committed on another level. Um, and the, the, those are really special moments, like the moment where we're sat on the logs by the Turlock and she tells me that it's her baby. Like that was um, like a real profound moment that I'll never forget when doing that in real life. Um, she really took me away with that. And then Charlie, it was really interesting because we both kind of make a conscious, we made a conscious effort not to let our familiarity off screen seep into what we did on screen because it was really, I guess, important that the audience can feel the the awkwardness and the lack of a familiarity between Elaine and Tom. So although I spent a lot of time with her off screen and I could tell you all about her amazing personality and what it's like to have her as a friend, I can't really tell you, you know, all I can tell you about working with her is that we just tried to make sure that there was this awkwardness or a barrier between our relationship when we were um, acting together. Well, great job. Um, you know, I think it really came across on the screen. Um, before I wrap things up, I just want to ask you guys, you know, obviously this is a very weird festival for us. It's a very weird time for people to be debuting their films. Um, talking to you over Zoom is less preferable than having you all here in Galway and being able to see you in person. Um, but what's uh, lockdown uh, been like for you? I mean, um, you know, has it creatively been fulfilling? Has it just been frustrating to have everything on pause? Um, I'm curious what people, um, how the pandemic has treated people. Maybe, uh, Phil, if we start with you. I've loved it. I've loved it. It, it suited me down to the ground. I, um, I've, I've felt so relaxed during the pandemic. It's so strange. <laughs> um, maybe because I'm living, like I'm living in London by myself. So like, I, I don't uh, worry about bringing anything when I go to the shops and bring anything back. But I've gotten so much more work done than usual. I've been able to sleep way better. Like watching, I'm, I'm getting through my watch list on IMDb. Like, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's great, and it's great that you guys have like really like pulled it out of the bag and got it, got it together to be able to do something. Like, you know, a lot of festivals weren't willing to do this, and they're shutting up for the year. So, so fair play to you guys. We yeah, appreciate that. We appreciate you uh, letting us show your film, uh, Mark. About yourself? Uh, yeah, for me, at, at first. It was a bit weird. I, I started off in the lockdown in a, I was in LA and I was only supposed to be there for a month. And then I ended up being there for three months, which was strange, but I, I don't know. I kind of, I kind of like it too. I, uh, I mean, I've been working a lot on music and stuff like that. And I feel like it, it calms a lot of anxieties you have about general real life because the choice is, removed i mean like the choice to do something and to like to have to like i mean a lot of people are still doing their jobs for like going to work and needing to get to work on time like all the minor anxieties in your life are just completely removed so i think that aspect of it's quite nice but at the same time i do go a bit mad some days and i just kind of want to see the lads and all that kind of stuff you know <laughs> yeah definitely get that david yeah. yourself um <laughs> It's been weird for me. I mean, one of the weirdest things is that, you know, people keep saying to me, oh, but you know, you're a writer. Too. So nothing has changed for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yes and no. <laughs> um, I, I was tra traveling at the, the time the lockdown kind of came in. So I ended up being stuck, not in my home, but in, in the home that I grew up in um, alone. Um, so I've sort of been, I was sort of alone with the kind of ghosts of my teenage self for three months. <laughs> you get a couple of scripts out of that. Uh, and I had, um, and, and the other thing is the internet here is kind of rubbish. So I couldn't really watch, you know, I couldn't stream anything. So I, I had to 
I have this pile of films that are like the challenging films that I that I'm always going to watch but never you know do <laughs> and so um, I, I worked my way through the challenging films I watched like a woman under the influence and all these kind of things that I've been supposed to watch for years and never done. So um, I, I watched that kind of stuff and that was fun. That sounds good to me. Uh, Anson, how's your lockdown been? It's been, yeah, good. I feel so weird saying that because it's, a bit, <laughs> it's a, like the worst time ever for so many people. So it feels really strange to say that I've enjoyed myself. I feel really guilty about that for some reason, but oh uh, yeah, it's been really, I feel like so often with, um like being an actor it's like you're just here there and everywhere and you don't get time to have enjoy your real life and um i've just been at home with my family and that's been really sort of like refreshing and it's nice to just have this these few months to catch up on normal life and but now i feel like i'm ready to go back to work which is nice because it's like i'm geared up to go back to work and i'm excited to go back to work um so it's been like a nice reset moment for me i think yeah, nice. I think that's, uh, it's great to hear. I think that's why I like asking that question, just to see uh, uh, how creative minds have been spending uh, their time um, during this, you know, weird time that we're living through. Um, at least audiences at home now have your film to uh, pass some more of the time with. Um, thanks again for sharing it with us. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening and for being part of the online Goi Film Flaw. And uh, well done again. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.